So this morning we are going to have a lecture on the development and congenital malformations of the reproductive systems. This is a lecture I prefer giving in two parts. So today we will focus on the first part, which focuses on how sex is determined prenatally and how the gonads develop. In the second part, which we will do next week, we will look at how the internal and external genitalia develop in both male and female. Um, so this one is a shorter lecture. I chose to bring it today so that tomorrow morning, uh, because we have ample time, we can look at development and congenital malformations of the digestive system because that one is relatively longer. So I chose we bring it tomorrow. So again, remember tomorrow class will still start early and uh, we will finish, uh, will take quite some time tomorrow. Okay, so let's focus on today, sex determination and development of the gonads. We are going to focus on a number of things still. The first agenda is just to state where the reproductive systems come from embryologically. Then we are going to explain what the indifferent stage of genital development mean. After that, we are going to explain how sex is determined prenatally. We will just focus on the prenatal one. The postnatal one has a lot of issues and the theories, and uh, that is not beyond. That is quite beyond the scope of uh, this lecture. And then we will talk about what we call the indifferent gonad, how it forms and how it differentiates. After that, we'll then look at how the ovary and the testes develop. And finally, we'll look at the associated congenital anomalies with regard to what we have just talked about today. So, Without further ado, we can start by looking at the first objective, which is the embryonic origin of the genital systems. So if you remember your lecture on various body systems, you know that most of the time you start from this structure here where the blue represents ectodermal structures the yellow represent uh, endodermal structures and that other color represent mesoderm. And that mesoderm has three parts, the paraxial mesoderm, which gives you the axial skeleton, also gives you the dermatom and the myotome. Then we have intermediate mesoderm here and lateral plate mesoderm that has two layers, the somatic layer giving you a appendicular skeleton and some part of the dermis of the skin. Um, Splanchnic layer, which gives you smooth musculature, cardiac musculature, and the connective tissue of internal organs. The intermediate mesoderm here is our interest this morning. The intermediate mesoderm is the one that uh, gives you the reproductive system. The reproductive system is not the only thing that comes from the intermediate mesoderm. Even the renal systems also arise from the intermediate mesoderm. And it is for this reason that uh, there are some embryonic structures which are shared between the reproductive and the renal systems. So that's our first agenda down the reproductive system arise from the intermediate mesoderm. That story, you most likely knew it even before today. Let's go to what we call the indifferent stage of genital development. The indifferent stage of genital development is a bipotential phase of the reproductive system. 
remember it is embryonic. During this time, it refers to a time and morphological period when the embryonic structures that give rise to the reproductive systems have full potential of either becoming male or becoming female. There's a time period, yes, and there is also a morphological period, which means when you look at the structure of that embryonic structure, you cannot really tell whether it will be male or it will be female because it's a uniform anatomical structure. So there's a time period when the reproductive system has full potential of either becoming male or either becoming female. That is what we call the indifferent stage. Morphologically, the structures present there can either become male sex organs or female sex organs with full potential. This concept of indifferent stage applies to three things. It applies to the development of the gonads. It applies to the development of the internal genitalia. And it applies to the development of the external genitalia. Having said so, let's explain what each of the indifferent stages really mean. Let's start with the indifferent gonad. You can call it the indifferent stage of gonado development. The indifferent stage of gonado development is characterized by the presence of an elevation in the posterior abdominal wall. That elevation in the posterior abdominal wall is called the gonadal ridge or the indifferent gonad. The gonadal ridge or the indifferent gonad. This gonadal ridge forms just medial to the mesonephric ridge. You remember the region occupied by the second kidney systems, the mesonephros. So that is a mesonephric ridge. So just medial to that, we have the gonadal ridge, also called the genital ridge here. So it refers to that time period when there's a swelling in the posterior abdominal wall, medial to the developing kidney systems. That swelling represents the future gonad. That particular structure has a cortex and a medulla. Um, the outer cortex, the inner medulla is present there. This particular gonadal ridge, it has a cortex and a medulla. And it is the one that represents the future testis or ovary. So you can see it here. This is the indifferent gonad, which we also call the gonadal ridge or genital ridge. It is just an elevation in the posterior abdominal wall. It has an outer cortex and inner medulla. So at this stage of development, it is not possible to tell whether this gonadal ridge will develop into a testis or will develop into an ovary. And that is why we are calling it the gonadal, the, the indifferent gonad. So an indifferent gonad has that cortex and medulla. Then we have what we call the indifferent stage of the internal genitalia. The indifferent stage of the internal genitalia is marked by the presence of two key embryonic genital ducts. The names of these ducts are these ones. We have what we call the Wolfian duct and you have what you call the Mullerian duct. These ducts are present at some particular point of development. Now, the Wolfian duct, 
which is also called the mesonephric duct, is the embryonic primordium of the male internal genitalia. It is the embryonic structure that gives rise to the male internal genitalia. So when you talk of male internal genitalia, you know, you're talking about many things there. Uh, but you can look at the reproductive ductal system to be simple. So things like the epididymis, the vast difference, ejaculatory duct, seminovesicles, all arise from the Wolfian duct. Um, the prostate is part of the internal genitalia, but the prostate does not arise from the Wolfian duct. So there's a period of development where we have what you call the Wolfian duct. Whether this embryo will become male or will become female, the Wolfian duct is present at some point. This is not the first time you're hearing about the Wolfian duct. Perhaps you didn't call it Wolfian, you called it mesonephric. But remember, the mesonephric duct is the duct of the mesonephros. The mesonephros are the second kidney system. The kidney system that involutes at around the eighth, ninth week of development. So even though the mesonephros disappear, to give room for the metanephros to take over. The duct of the mesonephros persists as the mesonephric duct. And in males, it will persist to give rise to the male internal genitalia. The second duct forms just lateral to the Wolfian duct and we call it the Mullerian duct. The Mullerian duct, also known as the paramesonephric duct, is the embryonic primordium of the female internal genitalia. So we'll be talking more about Mullerian duct and Wolfian duct next week when you look at development of the internal genitalia and external genitalia. But today, I just want you to salivate on the fact that uh, we have a period of development where the embryo has both ducts present irrespective of whether this embryo will become male or will become female. Both ducts are present with the full potential of becoming the gender that they're supposed to form. So that time period when both ducts are present is what we are calling the indifferent stage of the internal genitalia. As you can see in this image, the mesonephric duct will become the male reproductive tract. The paramesonephric duct will become the female reproductive tract. But we are here at this point where both ducts are present. The third indifferent thing is the indifferent stage of the external genitalia. The indifferent stage of the external genitalia is characterized by the presence of three swellings in the external genitalia of the embryo or the fetus. These three swellings are these ones. There's something called the genital tubercle, which is one, and it appears in the midline. This genital tubercle is the embryonic primordium of either the penis or the clitoris with full potential. The second swelling is known as the urethrofold. The urethrofold is that one. Again, the urethrofold is the embryonic primordium of either the penile urethra or the labia minora with full potential. And lastly, we have the genital swelling, which is also called labioscrotal swelling. And as the name suggests, the genital swelling or the labioscrotal swelling is a primordium of either the labia majora in female and the scrotum in males. So this image shows you 
the three swellings, genital tubercle, which can either form the penis or form the clitoris. It also shows you the urethral folds, which can either become the labia minora, as we see on your left image, or can become fused and be incorporated in the penis as the penile urethra, as you can see on the right-hand side. It also shows you the third swelling, the labioscrotal swelling, which can remain apart longitudinally folded to become the labia majora, or can grow towards each other and fuse to become the scrotum, as you can see on the right-hand side. So now we are talking about this period when the external genitalia is indifferent, that is what we are calling the indifferent stage of development of the external genitalia. The time period when there are three swellings present and you can't tell what they will become. Good, so that then raises the question. Having talked about three indifferent stages, when we don't know what they'll become, what therefore determines what they become? How is sex determined prenatally? Sex determination and differentiation occurs in a very strict and time dependent manner. Strict to mean there's some molecules that control it and time dependent to mean that uh, it is only possible within a particular period beyond which it may not be possible to do the right thing. There are three steps or stages in sex determination. And these ones happen prenatally. The first step is the determination of the genotypic sex. We can also call the chromosomal sex. The second step is the determination of the gonadal sex. And the third step is the determination of the phenotypic sex. We can call it the anatomical sex. We will explain what each of these three mean. Let's start with what we are calling the genotypic or the chromosomal sex determination. <clears throat> when you talk of chromosomal sex or genotypic sex, I'm just referring to which sex chromosomes are present in this particular embryo. When you look at the nucleus, which chromosomes, which sex chromosomes are present? So, Remember, the answer to this question could be that the embryo is 46XX or 46XY. And if the embryo is 46XX, then you want to call that female. And if the embryo is 46XY, you want to call that one male. This type of sex is determined at conception. It depends on the type of sperm that fertilizes the oocyte. So the key to this concept is this. The genotypic sex is based on the presence of the Y chromosome. If the embryo has a Y chromosome, then that embryo is genetically supposed to be male. If the embryo is lacking the Y chromosome, then that embryo is genetically female. So the females are not females because they have two eggs. They are females because they lack the Y chromosome. The genotypic sex is based on the presence of the Y chromosome. The reason is because usually the Y chromosome encode for some bio, 
uh, biochemical modifiers that direct and regulate male sexual development. Yet in the absence, there's a default. The default pathway is to develop the female sexual structures. So if the Y chromosome is absent, the default pathway will override, which is female. But if the Y chromosome is present, then it will direct development towards male pattern. Of importance is this, that the Y chromosome contain a gene within it, which we call the SRY gene. SRY gene stands for sex determining region of the Y chromosome. Sex determining region of the Y chromosome. So this SRY gene is the one that codes for some particular information that direct development of the testes in particular. It directs development of the testes. It's the one that causes the indifferent gonad to form the testes instead of the ovary. So it's very important that gene that contains code for something that directs the indifferent gonad to become the testes. Okay, so you know that there are two sex chromosomes, the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. I'm saying that the Y chromosome has a gene somewhere called the SRY gene, the direct development of the testes. So the presence of Y chromosome would mean the presence of the SRY gene. That would mean then that the baby is likely to become male because it will form a testis. The absence of the same would then mean that uh, the ovary will form. So remember that, uh, okay, there's a slide missing there. Something has disappeared here, um, but I can still explain what should be. So remember that uh, when mama and baba met, uh, there are two types of, of sperms that baba produce. There's sperms, haploid sperms with Y chromosome, haploid sperms with X chromosome. And then mama only produced oocyte with X chromosome. So if the Y sperms fuses with the oocyte, the resultant zygote is 46 XY. And that is genetically male. If the Y, if the X chromo X sperm is the one that fertilizes the oocyte then the resultant zygote is 46 XX and that is genetically female. Right. Let's talk about the second type of sex determination, which is gonadal sex determination. So gonadal sex determination simply answers the equation what will the indifferent gonad become? Will it form a testis or will it form an ovary? If it forms a testis, you call that male. If it forms an ovary, you call that female. So gonadal sex is based on the presence of those molecular instructions which are encoded by the SRY gene. So that means what? If those molecular instructions are present, then the indifferent gonad is directed to become the testis. In particular, one of those molecular instructions is called TDF. TDF stands for testicular determining factor. So this SRY gene codes for this thing called testicular determining factor. 
this molecule, when present, it will stimulate the indifferent gonad so that the indifferent gonad becomes a testis. Remember, SRY is just a gene. So the gene encode for something. And so TDF is that something. It is the TDF that stimulates the indifferent gonad to then form the testis instead of the ovary. Therefore, what does that mean? If the embryo is not having the SRY gene, in simple terms, the TDF is absent. It means that uh, the indifferent gonad as a default pathway will then form the ovary. And so that's how gonadal sex is determined. However, it is important for you to note this one, that the type of fetal gonad present determines a very important thing. The type of fetal gonad present determines the predominant sex hormone in the fetus. So if the fetus has an ovary, there's a particular way the hormones are going to be. If the fetal gonad is the testis, then again, there's a particular predominant hormone that will be present. And those hormones are the ones that influence the next sex type. So it's very important that we know the fetal gonad at this point. So this is the story. You have an indifferent gonad, which is a bipotential phase. The indifferent gonad is having a cortex and a medulla. You don't know whether it's become testis or ovary. In a scenario where the embryo is 46XY, it means that uh, the Y chromosome is present. Therefore, it means that uh, the SRY gene is present. This gene encodes for the TDF, testicular determining factor. And this will direct differentiation of the indifferent gonad to testicular lineage. How about the other way around? If the genotype of the zygote is 46XX, which means that uh, there is no Y chromosome, that means there is no SRY gene, that means that there is no TDF. In the absence of TDF, then different gonad forms the ovary. That is determination of the gonadal sex. The gonadal sex determination occurs between the sixth to the 10th week of development. The third sex type, we are calling phenotypic sex or the anatomical sex. Phenotypic sex just refers to which reproductive organs are present. It applies to both the internal organs as well as the external genital organs. However, for practical purposes, we usually just look at the external genitalia and classify you as male or female. So basically the anatomical sex is what we observe at birth. Or even now, someone looks at your external genitalia, then they call you male or they call you female. We don't have to scan through and confirm whether you have a uterus or a prostate. But when you talk of anatomical sex for clarity, it applies to the organs which are present, except for practical purposes, we just look at the external genitalia and we determine that you are male or female. So you know what male then means, there's a scrotum and a penis, call it male. There's a cleft, clitoris, labia, I call it female. What determines the type of organs that form? <clears throat> the anatomical sex is largely determined by the presence of significant androgenic hormone activity. 
and I'm underlying significant because androgens would be present. But if the levels are not significant, then it will not give you a particular information. So it has to be significant. If there is significant androgen activity, the indifferent internal genitalia and the indifferent external genitalia undergo what we call virilization. Virilization is the patterning towards the male phenotype, which means that uh, the indifferent internal genitalia and the indifferent external genitalia will form the male sex organs. If we don't have significant androgenic hormone activity, that will be most likely coupled with the presence of estrogens. In that context, the indifferent genital structures, whether internal or external, will differentiate towards the female phenotype. And that means we'll have the female anatomical sex. That is how anatomical sex is determined. It's based on the presence of significant androgenic common activity. Now, this then raises the question, what will determine whether we have significant androgenic hormone activity. We've also brought the concept of estrogens into be. Remember, these are sex hormones. So perhaps we answer this question. Where, what are the sources of sex hormones during pregnancy? Now, this is the answer to this question. The placenta produces sex hormones. In particular, placenta produces estrogens. Okay. Another source of hormones is the maternal ovary. Now, which hormone will the maternal ovary produce? Estrogens. Another source is the fetal adrenal cortex. Whether the fetus is genetically male or genetically female, gonadally male or gonadally female, the fetal adrenal cortex produces androgens, the male sex hormones. It doesn't matter whether the fetus is genetically male or genetically female, gonadally male or gonadally female, the fetal adrenal cortex produces androgens. The last source is a fetal gonad and especially the testes. <clears throat> the fetal testes produces androgens. The fetal ovary is hormonally silent it does not produce the hormones. It is hormonally silent. So what will determine whether the androgens are the ones that override or the estrogens are the ones that override? The key determinant is the fourth one there. If the fetogonad is the testis, then the androgens here, coupled with androgens here, will override and they'll influence the development of the indifferent genitalia towards male pattern. If the fetal testis is absent, which means that the fetal ovary is present, the ovary is hormonally silent. So the only source of androgens is the adrenal cortex. This will not be adequate to cause virilization. In that case, the estrogens override and that will lead to differentiation towards the female phenotype. So I hope you've understood how sex is determined. Let's make a summary of what you've said. We have said that there are three types of sex prenatally, the genotypic sex, gonadal sex, and phenotypic sex. The genotypic sex just answers the question, what 
chromosomes does the zygote have? Is the zygote 46XX, call it female? Is it 46XY, call it male? This type of sex is determined at fertilization. And it is based on the type of sperm that fertilizes the oocyte. If the oocyte is fertilized by Y sperm, the zygote will be 46XY male. If the oocyte is fertilized by X sperm, the zygote will be 46XX, call it female. So that is genotypic sex determination, also called chromosomal sex determination. It occurs at fertilization. Gonado sex determination is based on what does the indifferent gonad become. If the indifferent gonad becomes ovary, we call it female. And if it becomes a testis, we call it male. What influences differentiation of the indifferent gonad is usually the TDF. Now, the determination of the indifferent gonad to either testes or ovary occurs during that time period between the sixth to the 10th week of development and is based on the presence of the TDF. Now, TDF is a protein that is encoded by a gene called the SRY gene. And SRY gene, we've said, is standing for sex determining region of the Y. And that means it's based on the presence of the SRY gene, which means it is based on the presence of the Y chromosome. So if the Y chromosome is present, that means SRY gene is present, it will encode for TDF that will direct the indifferent gonad to become the testis. If the SRY gene is absent, which means perhaps 46XX, it means that there is no SRY gene. And in that case, there is no TDF. By default, the ovary becomes. That is going to sex determination. Phenotypic sex determination. Phenotypic sex determination is based on what does the indifferent internal genitalia and what does the indifferent external genitalia become? So remember, we just want them to be either the male or the female organs, both internal and external genitalia. OK, so on this account, the gonads, sorry, the organs which are present usually are determined slightly later than the gonado sex. I can't give you a time period because they just follow one another, but this one is ahead of this one. Gonado sex determination is ahead of this one, but it doesn't have to be completed before this one begins. These things are running together with the gonado sex determination ahead. So it's just okay to be politically correct and say a little later. The gonads influence the type of hormones which will be present. And so in particular, we are concerned with androgenic hormone activity. If there is significant androgenic hormone activity, then the indifferent genitalia undergoes virilization so that it will form the male sex organs. If we don't have significant androgen hormone activity, the indifferent genitalia will then differentiate into female phenotype. Great, <clears throat> that is how sex is determined prenatally. So this will be the focus of next week. We will look at this internal, in different internal genitalia and how it becomes either the male or the female phenotype. 
we'll also look at the indifferent external genitalia and see how it becomes the female anatomical sex or the male anatomical sex. Now, let's narrow down to how the indifferent gonad forms and how it will become either the testis or the ovary. We have indicated that uh, <clears throat> the testis and the ovary differentiate from the indifferent gonad. I've also told you that this indifferent gonad is in the posterior abdominal wall arising from the intermediate mesoderm. Perhaps something that you need to take note of is that uh, the indifferent gonad is formed by proliferation of the cells of the intermediate mesoderm together with the epithelium that is covering the inter intermediate mesoderm. So both the mesodermal tissue, which means mesenchymal, together with the covering epithelium. The covering epithelium is the epithelium of the interembryonic silom, the silomic epithelium. So because of that proliferation, there will be an elevation. The elevation that is formed in the posterior abdominal wall is known as the gonadal ridge. This gonadal ridge is here. That, okay, is it red? The one next to the blue? So that's the gonadal ridge. You can call it genital ridge. It is just medial to the mesonephric ridge, the ridge of the mesonephros. In cross section, this is the gonadal ridge, and this is the mesonephric ridge. Before this differentiation occurs, the two swellings, there'll be one big swelling, which we usually call the urogenital ridge. So the urogenital ridge is the one that splits into medially the genital ridge or gonadal ridge and laterally the mesonephric ridge or the urinary ridge. Remember that in the posterior abdominal wall, Now, the cells of the gonadal ridge usually reorganize themselves into irregular cords. We are now familiar with what cells arranged in cords mean. The cells of the gonadal ridge reorganize into cords. These cords are a bit irregular. Those irregular cords are the ones we call the primitive sex cords. So these are the primitive sex cords, those irregular cords of cells the gonadal ridge, covered by that black thing, the epithelium. So the epithelium proliferates. Then we have the sex cords also there present. Right. <clears throat> when the primitive sex cords are formed, around the same time, I wouldn't want to say one form, then another one. Things are happening at the same time. At that very time that the cells of the gonadal ridge are rearranging themselves into cords, the primordial germ cells are also migrating from, remember our lecture of gametogenesis, they come from the wall of the yolk sac and also from the wall of the allantois. The primordial germ cells migrate from the wall of allantois and yolk sac into the developing gonad. So they migrate, these red dots represent the primordial germ cells. They migrate and invade the developing sex cords. It is important that you realize that the presence of the pre prim primordial germ cells is obligatory for normal gonadal development to happen. What I mean is if there are no primordial germ cells within the developing gonad, the gonad will cease to develop. It will be arrested. There'll be a dysgenesis. So it is important that the primordial germ cells invade. And remember these primordial germ cells are the ones that will 
become the stem cells for oocytes or stem cells for sperm for the sperms. That means they'll either become the oogonia or the spermatogonia. I hope you remember that story from gametogenesis. Now, at this stage, when the primitive sex cords have been invaded by primordial germ cells, we call this the indifferent stage of gonadal development. We can't tell whether this gonad will become the testis or will become the ovary. So that is the indifferent stage of gonad development. It is a bipotential phase. This indifferent gonad, as it develops further, the primitive sex cords reorganize into two zones. The zone inside the medullary cords. The zone outside the cortical cords so that the indifferent gonad has a cortex and a medulla. That's what I mean. The indifferent gonad has a cortex and a medulla. The cortex is outside, the medulla is inside. Remember, there are still sex cords. So we have the sex cords in the cortex, we have the sex cords in the medulla. That is still indifferent gonad. So remember what we said that uh, if the SRY gene is present, we will go to the testicular lineage. And if the SRY gene is absent, we'll go to the ovarian lineage. Okay, now let's then talk about how the specific gonads form. We start with testicular development. So we are starting from there in different stage. We go to there in different stage. For testicular development, the medullary cords of the indifferent gonad are the ones that proliferate. Remember, this is in the presence of TDF. So in the presence of TDF, the medullary sex cords are the ones that proliferate. At the same time, the cortical sex cords degenerate. So TDF causes the medullary sex cords to proliferate and cortical sex cords to involute. Remember that. That's the whole point. In terms of origin of the cells, the spermatogonia which are present in the testes will come from the primordial germ cells that invaded the developing gonad. Remember, the primordial germ cells invaded the developing gonad. So these are the ones that will give us the spermatogonia. Sertoli cells in the testes arise from this epithelium, the epithelium that is overlying the gonadal ridge is the one that gives you the Sertoli cells. The interstitial cells of Leydig, the ones that produce androgens, differentiate from the mesenchymal cells, the cells of the intermediate mesoderm. The interstitial cells of Leydig produce androgens as well as producing um, insulin like three. It's also a hormone which also determines um, something I'm going to talk about shortly. Once the indifferent gonad has proliferated its medullary sex cords, and so that means we are developing the testes. Remember that the testes was in the abdomen, the gonad is in the abdomen. The testes undergoes migration phase. It migrates from the abdomen to the scrotum through the inguinal canal. This migration path usually commences on the third month of fetal life. And remember, the migration is retroperitoneal. The gonads are retroperitoneal. So in the retroperitoneum, they migrate through the inguinal canal. 
there are many theories that explain or try to explain the concept of testicular migration, which are beyond the scope of this lecture. But there are some hormones which have been associated with testicular migration. Those two hormones, insulin-like three, which come from the interstitial cells of Leydig of the testes, and also testosterone, which is also being produced by the testes. They influence migration. How they do is beyond the scope of this lecture. Um, the other thing is that there's a structure called the gubernaculum that is also known to guide the path of migration of the testes. You can check on them at your own time. Now, it is important for you to note that the sex codes of the testes really remain solid until puberty, when now they acquire the lumen. So when that lumen forms, now you call them seminiferous tubules of the testes. So the point is that those sex codes are the ones that will become seminiferous tubules, yes, but the lumen of the seminiferous tubules is rudimentary until puberty. But now when puberty reaches the aqua lumen, that's when now spermatogenesis can begin. This is the seminiferous tubules, this is the lumen. Now spermatogenesis can begin at puberty. That is testicular development. Now let's talk about ovarian development. In ovarian development, we switch the, the sex codes. In ovarian development, there is no testicular determining factor. In the absence of testicular determining factor, the cortical sex codes are the ones that proliferate while the medullary sex codes involute. That's the whole difference. So in terms of the cells, remember the primordial germ cells in this particular ovary will give you ugonia. And also remember that uh, once you have the ugonia, oogenesis begin prenatally. So the ugonia begin um, mitotic division to give you primary oocytes and the primary oocytes also begin meiosis, but they become arrested at prophase one. These are the primordial germ cells that invaded that will give you the, the ugonia. There are some cells that will surround the primary oocytes. The cells that surround the primary oocytes are the follicular cells. Follicular cells, just like uh, Sertoli cells, differentiate from the surface epithelium. Remember that the supporting cells. We call them follicular cells when they are squamous, like these ones. And then when they become cuboidal like these ones, we prefer using the term uh, granulosa cells. So follicular cells are the squamous cells, the granulosa cells are the cuboidal cells. So the ovary also descends, but not to the scrotum, of course, but to the pelvic cavity. It's just a slight descent. Otherwise, the ovary does not get, uh, migrate much. Just a slight descent to the pelvic cavity. Remember, eugenesis begins prenatally, but meiosis is arrested at prophase one and can only be undone every cycle postnatally. Okay, <clears throat> our last agenda. Our last agenda is now to talk about congenital malformations that are related to the story we've given this morning. I'll start with gonadodysgenesis. Gonadodysgenesis may occur if the primordial germ cells do not invade the developing gonad. In this case, the gonad will not develop. So it will be not there. And uh, of course, 
if there are no primordial germ cells, then it means this person is infertile. The gonad is dysfunctional because there is no spermatogonia, there is no oogonia. In this case, what was supposed to be the gonad will just become fibrous tissue. No testis, no ovary. The term given to this fibrous structure is strict gonad. So in gonadal dysgenesis, we have strict gonads. There is no testis, there is no ovary. A question to you, and this one I want you to answer in the chat. I'll enable it for you. Okay, it seems enabled already, but I've enabled in such a way that uh, I'm the only one who is able to see what you are writing. Okay, that's the question, and I'm giving you one minute to respond. Okay, one minute is over. Um, I've seen your responses. Um, there's some I've gotten right, there's some I've gotten wrong but no big deal. So the correct answer is female phenotype. Um, uh, you will revisit why it should be female phenotype. <clears throat> the second type of disorders I want to talk about are the intersex disorders. We call them disorders of sex development, DSDs. Intersex disorders are con congenital conditions in which development of the three types of sex is not typical. So why do I say that? Either the chromosomal sex is not typical or the gonadal sex is not typical or the anatomical sex is not typical. We make a diagnosis of a disorder of sex development on two accounts. On one account, we look at the genitalia. And especially you look at the external genitalia. You can see, look at internal genitalia, no big deal. But uh, what strikes attention is the external genitalia. So when you look at the external genitalia and you are looking at this baby and you're wondering, is this male or is it female? If the genitalia does not appear typical of either male or female, we call that disorder of sex development or intersex disorder. When that genitalia is not appearing typical, the common term we use is ambiguous genitalia. So you make a diagnosis of intersex disorder if there is an ambiguous genitalia. But that's not the only account where we make a diagnosis of DSD. Sometimes the external genital is typical for male or typical for female, but there's a problem. The problem here is that the genital appearance is not concordant with the genotypic sex. Perhaps this person is 46XY, so genetically male, but the external genitalia is typical for female. That is still a disorder of sex development. So remember this second one don't necessarily have ambiguous genitalia. They may do have something, but they don't necessarily have ambiguous genitalia but they still have a chromosome which is not concordant with that anatomical sex. So we make diagnosis of DSD on those two accounts. Look at these images, show you various examples of DSDs. So when you look at that genitalia, you wonder, yeah, not typical for female. These are clitoromegalies, not typical for female. 
look at this one. Okay, so there's a penis there, but uh, there's no bilaterally, the testes are not palpable. So that means that the scrotum are really flat, not typical for male. This one, <clears throat> the genitalia is female from the look of things, but they are ovaries on either side in the positions of the testes. So not typical for female. Okay, look at that one. Yes, male, but uh, there's some severe malformation there. This one looks immature, but apart from the immaturity, again, it's ambiguous. It's an imba, in a, uh, ambiguous immature genitalia. Look at those ones, that's clitoromegaly still. This is male, but there's a hole um, just next at the base of the penis there, perhaps a severe hypospadia. And so it makes the genitalia not to be typical. Um, this is perhaps for the postgraduates who are present in the class. <clears throat> we, one of the things that we check is the anogenital ratio. The anogenital ratio is you measure the distance from the anus to the posterior fossae. Call that distance A. Then you also measure the distance from anus to the base of the penis or basically the phallus that's present and we call that distance B. So you measure this distance A over B. Typically you do this on an external genitalia that's supposed to be female and you look at that ratio. So if the anogenital ratio is greater than 0 0.5, then it means that there is some significant androgen activity that acted on the female external genitalia the female external genitalia is trying to undergo virilization. Usually it's a measure of posterior labial commission or posterior labial fusion. This labia should be split. So when you have posterior labial fusion, significant posterior labial fusion in a female genitalia, that's also a DSD. We will revisit that when you look at development of the external genitalia. That concept, was just targeted to the postgraduates in the class. Okay, <clears throat> what are the causes of intersex disorders? We can have intersex disorder if you have a numerical abnormality that is affecting the sex chromosome, or if you have a structural abnormality that's affecting the sex chromosome. That's one cause. Another cause is if there is insufficient androgenic action in a baby who is XY individual, like in the scenario I gave you about gonadodysgenesis, the baby was XY, so genetically male, but anatomically that baby will be female, as I told you, because if there is gonadodysgenesis, then it means that uh, there'll be no androgen there'll be no significant androgenic activity. This can also be there when you have what you call <coughs> testicular feminization syndrome, or what we call androgen insensitivity. The androgen is there, the hormone is there, but the receptors for the androgens are insensitive. So we call that androgen insensitivity. The baby would be anatomically female in as much as genetically will be male and even gonadally male, these are testes. But the test is producing androgens, but these androgens are not doing what? They're not acting on their receptors. So you can still have female external genitalia 
in as much as these are testes and the baby is XY. Third cause is if there is a lot of androgen activity in a baby who is XX a genotype. And you ask yourself, what will cause this? One of the causes would be if there is a problem with biochemical uh, conversion of the androgens to estrogens. So those are metabolic disorders that affect the steroids. It can also be if the, what is it called? Uh, the adenocortex is a bit big. We call that congenital adrenal hyperplasia. If the adenocortex is a bit big and so it's producing a lot of androgens in a baby who is XX, it may cause virilization of the genitalia. These are the causes of uh, DSDs. So in common cases, you suspect an intersex disorder if the genitalia is not typical that's what we call ambiguous genitalia. If the clitoris is too big, or if the penis is too small, or if the urethra is opening near the scrotum, if the testes are not felt on both sides, if by ultrasound you see, or MRI imaging, you see something that has both features of ovary and testes, and if there is no gonad. Those are intersex disorders. Lastly, another congenital anomaly based on what we discussed today is look at this one. This test is, is not there or at least maybe up and this one is okay. Sorry. So this is what we call undescended testes. We call it cryptokidism or undescended testis. So when there is undescended test, it can be anywhere, perhaps in the abdomen, perhaps in the inguinal canal, or within the scrotum. The one in the inguinal canal is the commonest one, but can also be in the abdomen, can be high up in the scrotum. This is cryptokidism. Okay, that's the end of that lecture. Uh, we've talked about sex determination, and we have also talked about development of the gonads and associated malformations. So next week, we will look at part two of this lecture, where we're going to look at development of the internal genitalia, as well as development of the external genitalia. So, I'll give you a few minutes to ask questions if you do have, and then we'll, we'll stop.